Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Earthworks Project from Woman Song. I'm your hostess, Jolivet Williams, and today we will introduce you to the fascinating and personally rewarding science of foraging for wild edibles. If you are a new listener, feel free to join in the discussion by calling us at 310 634 1953. You can also join us on our Facebook community page at facebook.com forward slash The Earth Work. The Earth Work Project is also a part of the Woman's Song community experience. And so you can find us on YouTube at Woman's Song. And there you will find announcements of upcoming podcasts, playlists, that I've created with the new homesteader in mind. There we will also chronicle our exploit in homesteading. In particular, we will focus on uh, beekeeping, which as if you've been listening to any of the podcasts, you know that that is something that I'm going to be doing this spring and I'm very, very excited about. So we will chronicle that. And there you will also find highlights from previous shows. So feel free to follow us as well on Twitter at Woman Song. Now, before we go any further, I have to give a brief disclaimer and warning. Uh, The critical factor in using plants for food is to avoid accidental poisoning. So it is important that you understand that you must eat only those plants that you have positively identified and that you know are safe to eat. Absolutely identify plants before using them as food. And at times you may find yourself in a situation for which you could not plan. And in this instance, you may not have had a chance to learn the plant life in the region in which you must survive. And in this case, you can use several universal edibility tests to determine which plants you can eat and those that you must avoid. Now, later in this podcast, we are going to discuss those particular tests that qualify certain plant life and their uh, eligibility to be classified as food. And we're also going to discuss some other very important information that will assist you in becoming an expert Forager. Uh, Harvesting wild food is the oldest and most basic 
sustenance activity of humankind. But today we live in a world where these skills are almost lost. Forging is the missing link in modern civilized cultures and it is this direct physical connection in the form of sustenance that brings us to our deepest appreciation and understanding of the natural world. So we're going to reconnect today and our topics will include common edible plants such as dandelions and medicinal plants and herbs and some uncommon edibles that you may not have known were actually classified as foods like acorns, who knew, and cattails. Um, We're going to briefly look at mushrooming, foraging supplies, and rules of thumb and other useful tips, wild edibles, foraging with earthworks, today on the Earthworks Project. We'll be right back. Oh, yeah. 
Welcome back, and thank you for joining us. The song that we just enjoyed was Chiwoniso, and the song was Kurima, uh, one of my favorites from that CD. But again, thank you for being with us on our Power Lunch Hour to talk about foraging and wild edibles. First thing that we have to talk about when we are looking at the art of and the art and science of uh, foraging is we have to talk about safety because these plants can be lethal. And so it is important that we are uh, well-versed in what it is that we're doing when we go out and we forage. And I think that, that we will benefit most uh, if we do it the correct way to start with. Now, when we're starting with safety, the first rule of eating wild foods is that if you cannot identify a food with 100% certainty, don't eat it. And if you end up not being able to identify a foraged food, simply count it as a learning experience. And the best way to make a positive ID on a plant is to consult an experienced forager. But if you're like me, you may not know of an experienced forager in your area, and so you will have to go with the tried and true methods, a couple of books to cross-reference, and a few methods of testing edibles in the field. Now, we're going to go over those a little later in the podcast. But if a plant is new to you, try to cross-reference it in at least two or three sources before eating it. Now, the reason for that is because oftentimes a completely safe and edible plant will have a look-alike that can kill you. This is more true with mushrooms than plants, but it is a concern. So make informed decisions and enjoy the process. Now, it is also important to use the correct equipment. Another aspect of safety Uh, when it comes to foraging is making sure that you're using the proper equipment. The right tool for the right job makes that task most simple. Now, for the most part, all you will need to forage are some bags and an inexpensive pair of scissors and your favorite local guidebook. I used Linda Runyon's of the field. I have placed in the community page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the earth works. I learned from Linda Runyon maybe two or three years ago. I was very happy to find when I went back to her website that the course that I took that was a couple hundred dollars at that time is now under a hundred dollars. So she's actually brought the course down to a more reasonable cost, and I encourage anybody who is interested in seriously learning the art of foraging to look into a comprehensive course like hers where you have not only the book, but you also have cards that you can take out with you on your foraging journey. The cards are about the size of a a deck of playing cards, and they have a a little chain that goes through them so that you can clip them to your keychain or what have you and have them with you. And the pictures are very colorful and vibrant so that you can compare them to the plants that you're out searching. In addition, she has several other workbooks and a DVD lecture. Um, So I know that sounds like an infomercial, but It just happens to be where I learned, and so I'm partial to it uh, because I've seen other books that I've gotten from the library and other resources, and sometimes the crude drawings that are in these books make me kind of nervous because it's difficult, I think, at least for me to conceptualize what it is that the, you know, the artist rendering is, you know, demonstrating and what I am looking at outside whereas hers are very clear, they're color pictures and that kind of thing. So I really like and I really recommend this particular course. It's called Linda Runyon of the Field. You can find that, I think, at ofthefield.com, if I'm not mistaken. But if you search it, put it in any search engine, you should be able to find it. But anyway, the point is is that you'll need 
uh, your guidebook. And don't overlook the importance of dressing appropriately for your environment. So you must wear good shoes and pants. If, say, for example, you're in an area where there's heavy uh, poison ivies or oaks or sumac or rattlesnakes, this kind of thing, use a hat, gloves. Don't forget that if you're going to be uh, harvesting plants like the stinging nettles, uh, things that may have thorns and that kind of thing, be sure and protect yourself. And also be sure and take along plenty of water because, uh, what I found when I'm out, you may anticipate that you're going to be out an hour, but it does become very engrossing for some of us, and you're out a lot longer than you thought. So be careful about that. Uh, another aspect that, that I think falls under safety, too, is to keep your foraging close to home. The very best place to start foraging, in my opinion, so long as you don't use chemical pesticides and fertilizers, is in your own backyard. You may be surprised how many of the weeds that you're pulling from your garden that can actually be eaten. Purslane, uh, dandelion, pigweed are all wonderful foods. Now, in my case, I have located a huge patch of three-cornered leeks in my backyard that always came back. We cut down every year, um, and they're very uh, aggressive and they've taken over a very large portion of the backyard. Uh, and as it turns out, they are edible. They're wild edibles. They're absolutely delightful. They're called three-cornered leeks, but they are also called wild garlic. Now, if you start looking into the foraging websites and books and this kind of thing, you'll find that wild garlic can really, they'll label anything wild garlic because of the smell. Uh, the same way with the uh, onion, and I, I found that. So if you Google, say, wild garlic, you could find any number of pictures. But I did include a picture of the official name of the three-cornered leek or the wild garlic that I found in my backyard that all of these years I thought was a weed. All of us know about the dandelion, which as kids, you know, you pick it and you blow the, you know, this is when it goes to seed. You blow the uh, little white things off of the, the dandelion and it goes everywhere. And I'm sure that whoever is doing the landscaping appreciates that because you're giving it a hand to propagate. But it's actually food. Prior to getting to that state, once it goes to seed, there are various stages. And every part of the dandelion, from the root to the flower, is actually good for food. And we'll talk about that as well. As I was saying, what else can be eaten in your yard? Well, do you have fruit trees that perhaps you're not utilizing? In particular, I grew up with a crab apple tree. I had no idea. We had no idea that that was food. We thought that that was just this bitter apple thing. And actually, my family ended up cutting the tree down because we didn't use it for anything. And it just dropped those apples everywhere and the, the car would roll over them in the driveway and it was just a mess. When we don't know what we have available to us, uh, the same way with the um, with the acorn. Who knew that that was food? I, I did not. I know many of you probably did, but I did not. If you have berries or vines, I remember as a young girl, we had the, the, the climbing berries that we would go out and pick and just eat right there in the yard, similar to the honeysuckle. And that would probably be for the listeners who are in the South that remember the honeysuckle bushes. Um, those bushes were also considered by some intrusive, and an intrusive uh, bush. And anyway, you would just take the flower and pull the, the stem out and suck the nectar for a wonderful treat. The thing that we need to understand is that one of the most, I think, outstanding things for me while learning about foraging is that food is actually plentiful and it's everywhere. I mentioned on the initial broadcast uh, of this particular show, but I'm, I'm going to mention it again here because I think it's very applicable. When I was learning about foraging with the Linda Runyon uh, lessons, one of the things that always stood out to me was she made the comment on one of her DVD lectures that it pains her to see all of the pictures and commercials of the people on the continent of Africa 
who are not eating, who are starving. And then she says, and when the camera pans out, you see sheep's sorrel and other edibles right there near them. And they don't know. And so that always resonated with me, that you can starve to death if you don't know that you have food in your backyard. And so it became very important to me to not allow that to happen to myself or to anyone else that I knew. And so it it became a mission that I learned what was available and what was around me that I could take advantage of on a regular basis and, and familiarize myself so that I would have access to those resources whenever necessary. Now, getting back to what we were talking about before, after you've discovered what can be utilized from your yard, you have to start looking for food in safe areas near your home. You can look to your neighbor's yards, surrounding parks, ditches, fields, vacant lot, but always make sure that you understand what is happening to the land that you are foraging. For example, near me, there are vacant lots and there are any number of wild edibles. However, each year in my community, the city sprays those lots to keep down a high grass growth. Now, because I don't know what they're spraying, I will not forage there, you see. So we have to always be mindful and be safe. But after you have established whether or not an area has been sprayed, uh, you can ask the landowner. Start taking advantage of the foods in your area. Don't worry about collecting exotic plants. Concentrate on the plants which are unique to your area and especially what is abundant. Whenever you forage, be certain that you know the laws in your area and always forage with permission because it can be considered stealing if you forage on property that is not yours. It's also against the law to forage in most parks, specifically national parks. Do not over harvest and never take more than you need. These are simple, basic strategies to make sure that not only can others benefit, but that those plants will be there to propagate for you again next growing season. I have heard, now this is a sidebar, I heard one of the field rules of thumb for foraging for those who are untrained or who are out in the field and unable to, say if you don't have your books or you're unlearned uh, about the art of foraging, one rule of thumb that I have heard repeated several times is never eat anything that does not smell of onion or garlic. Now, with some research, I have found that that is a hard and fast rule, but it's hard to say that that is the absolute truth because there are some inedible plants that smell of onion. So in an emergency, I need you to use some of the other rules that we're going to talk about in a minute, but know that if you do employ the onion garlic smell rule, I imagine that the likelihood of running into something bad for you does decrease. All right? Now, here's the important thing. Don't be overwhelmed. Instead of trying to gain an encyclopedic knowledge of plants, focus on learning, say, just one plant a month. Focus on that plant. Get to know it well. How to identify it in all stages of its growth. And it's far better to be able to identify a small number of wild foods than it is to have a vague knowledge about a great number of plants. Now, the importance of understanding what happens with that plant as it grows in its different stages is simply because there are some plants that are edible when they're first uh, growing, say for example, the fiddlehead, just that's one that I can think of off the top of my head. When the fiddlehead is young and twirls, it is good to eat. When it grows, it is noxious. The older plant is noxious. So it is important to know the plant at its various stages and also how to prepare them because there are plants that are toxic while raw, but after being boiled or prepared properly, they are absolutely fine. Uh, One in particular is the acorn, which we're going to talk about. In its raw state, it can be harmful, but once it's processed, 
it's absolutely good for food. Anyway, the point is try to focus on what's local, what's near you, what's clean, and learn a few local plants and be really good at that so that if you're in a situation where there aren't any local foragers that can help you, then become that expert forager so that you can help others. Now, use foraged foods in your favorite recipes. Wild foods are more family-friendly when you use them in well-loved and familiar recipes. When considering how to use your new ingredients, first try to find a similar conventional ingredient and then substitute part or all of that ingredient into the recipe. For example, if you have wild leafy greens, use them in place of spinach in an enchilada or lasagna type recipe so that you can slowly begin to acclimate your family and yourself to the plant because um, even though a plant may be fully edible and you have no problem at all with the plant, too much of it, you know, if your system is not accustomed or if you're sensitive, too much of it can cause gastric distress. And so it may lead you to believe that, uh, you know, you're having a problem with it when actually you're not. Now, with these simple tips, wild foods can quickly and comfortably earn a regular place in your refrigerator. Now, the next time you're outside enjoying the fresh air and sunshine, have a good look into your surroundings. You might be surprised to find what you have right at your feet. Now, remember the following when collecting wild plants for food. Plants growing near your home and occupied buildings or along roadsides may have been sprayed with pesticides, so wash them fully. Uh, in most cases, I would not suggest using those at all. In the uh, particular lesson that, that I learned from Of the Field, it's a 100-foot rule. That is, uh, from the street, you need to go 100 feet in, away from the road, to start harvesting. Now, uh, the partic this particular instructor has said on more than one occasion that children automatically, just instinctively know that she has taken small children out to forage and from the roadside they will walk in at least 100 feet before they start picking things and, and asking about their usefulness. It is interesting that sometimes we are more connected to the earth than we give ourselves credit and some of this instinctive knowledge we've actually Unlearned, And so we simply need to remember, be careful of plants growing in contaminated water because some water contains not only harmful pathogens but also parasites. So you'll need to boil or disinfect those plants if you're in a survival situation where you don't have another choice. Some plants will develop extremely dangerous fungal toxins. So to lessen the chance of accidental poisoning with fungi, um, do not eat any fruit that is starting to spoil or show signs of mildew or a fungus. I think this is extremely applicable with berries. I've seen uh, growth on berries that way. Plants, as we discussed before, plants of the same species, differ in their toxicity and subtoxic compounds because of genetic and environmental factors. Be very, very careful and take your time when you are exploring. Don't take for granted that because you see dandelion growing and you know that dandelion leaf is edible, don't just grab up a bunch of it and go with that before you analyze where is it, where am I foraging, where is the potential water runoff coming from? And these kinds of things, so that you can always be safe. In addition, don't forget that some people are more susceptible to gastric distress from plants than others, okay? Some edible wild plants, such as the water lily rhizomes and the acorns, are bitter. And these bitter substances, which are usually tannin compounds, make them unpalatable, and boiling them in several changes of water 
will usually remove these bitter properties. Many valuable wild plants have high concentrations of oxalate compound, also known as oxalic acid. Now, these oxalates produce a sharp burning sensation in the mouth and throat, and they also damage the kidney. Baking, roasting, or drying will usually destroy these crystals, and the bulb of the jack in the pulpit is known as the Indian turnip. But you can eat it only after removing these crystals by slow baking or drying. Now back to the common edible, the dandelion. The umble, umble dandelion. I want to take some time with this particular plant because it happens to be one that I think is very beneficial and a great place to start. It was where I started during my foraging lessons because it is very abundant. In the south where I am, it grows year-round. So it's an easy, very easily identifiable uh, uh, wild edible in all of its stages. So... I would like to take some time just to focus on this particular common uh, edible. Now, the humble dandelion, they are so underappreciated, I think, in our age of pristine grass lawns. And I'll save the lawn rant for another day. But for now, let's appreciate the glory of this well-known, quote-unquote, weed. Now, dandelions are edible, but in addition to that, they are medicinal and they're so easy to find. They, uh, their uses range from salads to wines to medicinal tonics. They're absolutely wonderful. The root is really great for the kidney. The leaves are a diuretic, uh, great for edema. Now, the common dandelion gets its name from a French word, dentelion, or the lion's tooth. And it's related to chicory and wild lettuce. Dandelion leaves, flowers, and roots are all edible and are also very useful for making uh, various tinctures and remedies, especially um, for your liver and for your overall health. Now, dandelions were introduced to North America from Europe and have spread so rapidly that they grow nearly worldwide, Uh, though not on the official Louisiana list of noxious weeds, dandelions are often considered an extremely invasive alien species. It sounds very sci-fi, but the dandelion is not so menacing. Now, the way to identify the dandelion and what it looks like, I think most of you know. And the important thing, and there are no known dangerous lookalikes that can kill you. So, again, I think it is an absolutely outstanding start. But just in case that you're not familiar with the dandelion, I want you to listen to my brief description. The dandelions have a yellow composite flower that's about an inch and a half across, and the flowers are made of hundreds of tiny petals, and they grow individually on hollow flower stalks. Now, when they reach maturity, they transform into a white, spherical seed head and each seed has a little parachute that lets it float in the wind so the children i know i did it all the time you would just blow on it and it and all of them fly away um dandelion leaves are about three to twelve inches long and two to two and a half inches wide and they're always growing in a basal rosette that that means that they are clustered on the ground. They grow very low to the ground. The leaves are uh, lance-shaped and develop deeply toothed indentions with a distinct midrib running the length. Dandelions have a thick, brittle, beige taproot, and it grows about 10 inches long. Now, here's the clincher. When it's broken, both the root and the flower stalk ooze a white, milky sap. In most cases, if a plant oozes a milky sap, you don't want to eat it. The dandelion and one other plant are the only two exceptions in that case. But the dandelion roots are very difficult to remove. And as it turns out, the more you try to weed them up, the more pieces break off in the ground and the faster the dandelions grow back. So for our landscaping friends who are trying to get rid of the dandelion, not so good. For foragers, great. When considering where to find it, the dandelion, as I said before, 
grows everywhere, nearly everywhere. Dandelions love disturbed habitats such as lawn, sunny, open stretches of earth. Their habitat covers every state and province in North America and a great deal of Europe and Asia. Dandelions are so adaptive that their habitat may even be more widespread. Now, a better question is, where do you find it? Well, dandelions grow year-round, but the greens are harvested best in early spring and late fall when they are they have their, the least bitterness. The flowers are best harvested in mid-spring just after they bloom. And make sure to take only the yellow part because the green part of the flower is very bitter. And the tap root is actually, in my opinion, the tastiest. Uh, when you harvest it in the late fall and early spring. You can also roast that root and use it as a replacement for coffee. You'll find when foraging that a lot of different roots are touted as a replacement for coffee. I don't really know why because I don't think that really anything can replace coffee. If you're a real coffee drinker, you know, this that's not just not true. But anyway, it is used as once roasted as a replacement for coffee, but I love it just as a tea, to put it in the tea, and I actually eat the root. It's so delicious. It has a really, really great taste. The next easiest and abundant wild edible is the berry. They're very abundant and tasty, packed with a lot of vitamin C. Uh, Berries are one of the easiest foods to forage. They often abound in accessible areas, and there's so much variety. You can go from the gamut from the the yellow berries all the way to the dark black and purple uh, blackberries. Amongst the most common are those blackberries. You have the raspberries, mulberries, huckleberries. I actually have a mulberry tree growing in my backyard, and the uses range from, you know, juices and cordials to jams, jellies, pies, cakes, wine, ice cream. Look for berries in woodland areas, in hedgerows, and parks from late summer. Now, other common wild edibles, such as the honeysuckle, as I spoke about before, are not considered a wild edible in so much as nowadays people plant the honeysuckle specifically for decorative purposes. But that, too, uh, if you're from the South, would be a very familiar and common wild edible. So we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we will look at the uncommon wild edibles, those that most wouldn't consider an edible at all. Foraging wild edibles with Earthworks. We'll be right back. all life adventures, it's important to have someone that understands your vision and life's events. At Visions Designs, we're all about making sure our clients' visions are satisfied that's affordable on their budget. Our services include web design, custom logos, business cards, stationery, and we even perform wedding design and consulting assistance that's easy on your budget. Whatever our clients' needs are, we promise to bring our expert insights to your vision. Check us out on Facebook, Visions Design, or contact us by email, visionsbylauren at gmail.com to see your visions come to life today. I'm David James, a freelance graphic designer. I specialize in website creation, logos, flyers, posters, book covers, and anything else that you might need. My website is www.mokojumbi.net. That is M-O-K-O-J-U-M-B-I-E dot net. I also have inexpensive digital prints featuring African and Caribbean artworks. 
This can be seen at my other website, mokojumbi.imagekind.com. That is M-O-K-O-J-U-M-B-I-E dot imagekind.com. You can contact me at david at mokojumbi.net. I'm also on Facebook. Do a search for Digital Dingole. That is digital, D-I-N-G-O-L-A-Y. To the Women's Song community, thank you for allowing us to take this journey together. Thank you for joining us every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And especially for the ladies, there's a private Facebook group where you can speak freely and express the songs of your heart about issues specific to the African-American woman. Please follow us on Twitter at Woman Song and check out our YouTube channel for upcoming guests and highlights of our shows. We look forward to many more opportunities to rebuild, restore, and renew with the Woman Song Community Experience on Blog Talk Radio. As a strong woman, you will do the thing that many things cannot be done. When we speak of nation building, restructure, and advancement of our community, a society cannot succeed unless it can support itself and supply its own basic human needs. Let's learn those basic skills and crafts together. Advance the movement by listening in to our weekly podcast, where we will share books, featured speakers, instructional videos, and other relevant information on our community page, found at facebook.com forward slash The Earth Works, as we rediscover and remember how the Earth works. See you there. from the Woman's Song community. If you have any questions or would like to add to the discussion, you can reach us at area code 310-634-1953. Before the break, we actually had an opportunity to look at some of the most common, I think, foraging possibilities. And so now what I want to take the time to look at are the less common foraging opportunities or things that we might not consider as uh, resources and opportunities in our area. We have to reconsider the acorn for a moment. The oak nut falls to the ground by the thousands in nearly every state in the nation and in scores of shapes and sizes. You probably walked past several today. Acorns are all around us, yet rare are the people who can say that they've ever eaten them. Eating acorns are even uncommon among dedicated foragers. And I know what you're thinking, they're poisonous, intolerably bitter, flavorless, there's too much work to shell them, the the processing is too much. Uh, It's not worth the effort, but none of those things are are actually true. Making acorns good to eat is far easier than you might think. Uh, Why more people don't eat acorns is no mystery. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I think it's a plot perpetrated on us humans by the vast squirrel conspiracy, aided and abetted by the Blue Jays and the Magpie collaborators. Okay, 
Well, maybe not. But anyway, we can learn something by watching the squirrels. The squirrels don't bury every acorn they find, you know. Scientists have observed squirrels' behavior back east and noticed several unusual uh, things. The fuzzy vermins would seek out white oak acorns and gorge themselves on them and then dash off to find the acorns of other oaks, mainly the red oak. And powered by the meal of the, the white oak acorns, the squirrels would then spend hours burying the red oak acorns in the ground. Now, why is that? Well, it turns out that the white oak acorns are extremely low in the bitter tannins that give all acorns such a bad name. Red oak acorns are high in tannins, but tannins are water-soluble. So by burying them, the squirrels hit the acorns from the stealing blue jays and rival squirrels and put them into a water-rich soil. After the rains and the freezing snow and the thawing, the tannins would leach into the soil and leave the red oak acorns as sweet as the white ones. Now, this brilliant feat performed by what I personally call essentially a glorified bushy-tailed rat Uh, is the best way of showing you that there are acorns and then there are acorns. And some really are so bitter that they're not worth working with. But others, like the eastern white oak uh, and the emery oak of the southwest, uh, are sweet enough to need minimal or no processing. Now, knowing this goes a long way towards solving the forager's dilemma. Now, what dilemma is that, you might ask? Well, let's think about it for a second. If you're a skilled hunter, a gatherer, finding meat and fish is probably not terribly difficult. And wild greens, berries, and other uh, plants are pretty easy to find as well. Where things get tricky is that third leg of the nutritional stretch, which is starch. For the most part, finding a sufficient supply of the staff of life is no easy task. Now, if you live in the Northlands of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and such, you're blessed with wild rice. And further south lives the Jerusalem artichoke, which is a big tuber that grows underneath the little sunflower. Uh, Swampy places have the arrowhead, which is also known as the wapato, uh, the cattail, and the tool tubers. There are prairie potatoes in the Great Plains. And overlaying all of this are the oaks and their acorns. Now, unless you are near a swamp, there is no easier way to collect sufficient starch for a whole year than to collect and process acorns. And this is why many Native American groups did it, especially in California. Now, mind you, I'm not about to ask you to give up wheat or potatoes or rice or any of your common starches for a diet of acorns, but as an ingredient, As a piece of the larger diet, acorns deserve a serious place in our modern diet. And then the easy way to wrap your mind around this is to imagine acorns as free chestnuts, chestnuts that happen to need some processing before you eat them. Any chestnut recipe can become an acorn recipe. And in fact, acorns have been used this way in North Africa for millennia. They're still eaten with some frequency in Korea. And while not easy to find, you can suss out a few uh, acorn recipes from amongst the Berbers, the Spanish, Italians, and the French. Just for the record, it is also used as a replacement for coffee farther north. The Germans actually roast it and use it as a um, coffee substitute. Now, here is the really cool part about acorns that resonate with me because I'm a soap maker. This was so interesting when I found out about processing the acorn. There are several ways to prepare the acorn for consumption, one of which is boiling away the tannins, and another is cold soaking uh, in water. If you use the boiling method, do not throw away the tannic water. The water has a variety of uses with a mordant, which is it's like vinegar. When you're dyeing eggs or clothing, you have to put a mordant in that will cause the color to stick or bind to whatever it is you're trying to dye. So with a mordant, it can be used to dye clothing. And the tannic acid also makes a good laundry detergent. Two cups of the tannic water per load 
Now, here's the thing. It will temporarily color your tidy whities They will be tidy tannies. But just keep that in mind that they will be clean. And it is super cool that you have, as a byproduct of the process, uh, the processing of this particular nut, you get soap. So this is, um, uh, I think, very, very wonderful, the way that nature provides for us. Tannic water is also uh, antiviral and it's antiseptic. So it can be used as a wash for skin rashes, skin irritations, burns, cuts, abrasions, even for poison ivy. Now, while you can pour the tannic water over poison ivy, if you have the luxury uh, to freeze some of the brown water in ice cube trays, you can use the cubes for any ivy eruptions to bring, you know, and restore peace to the area that has been engaged. Now, if you have a sore throat, you can gargle with the tannic water and use it as a mild tea for diarrhea and dysentery. Externally, dark tannic water can be used on hemorrhoids or swelling. Hides soak in the tannic water and it makes better leather clothing. Using the brown water turned hides tan colored and that is why it's called tanning. And from there we get the word tannin and tannic as in tannic acid. In traditional tanning methods, whole hides are soaked in a vat of tannin water for a full year before uh, the hides are processed. Oak trees begin to produce acorns at about 20 years old, in case you didn't know. But usually the first full crop won't happen until the tree is 50. The average 100-year-old oak produces about 2,200 acorns a year, and only about 1 in 10,000 will become a tree. How amazing is that? That's about all that we have time for today. I really do appreciate you being with us this afternoon for this Power Lunch Hour. We will see you next week where we're going to look at the seeds of life. So join us again. We would love to have you as we rediscover and we remember how the earth works. See you then.